Ooh, recording in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Being <recorded>. yeah <laughs> uh, uh, you can start. You can start whenever you're ready. I mean. Okay. Yeah. I, um, we're we're going to go through. I, I'm kind of glad we're doing this. I've, I've got to do a an in-person thing in Huntsville Saturday and then in Nashville a week from Saturday. And I, um, this is, you're, you're the test test market here. Uh, I'm going to do a case study. Um, and listen, for those that don't know me, I've, I've been doing weather since the Civil War. Um, I, <laughs> uh, there's not many of me left, but Tom Skilling is retiring. And that, that's like... Uh, when Tom retires, there's not. I'm I, I'm probably the last guy standing here of my generation. But I feel great. I, I have zero desire to retire anytime soon. I'm going to drop dead doing this. Um, <laughs> but we're going to do a case study on a tornado event here that happened three years ago, and we'll just kind of go through some of the stuff. And I like case studies because uh, I like to learn from people what went right, what went wrong. So, are are you guys majoring in meteorology? Who am I talking to here? Um, most of okay. us, except for one. Yeah, I'm journalism. Weirdo. That, that's okay. Got a creeper in the room. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the man with the camera, uh, the reporter. Uh, all right. So, so again, uh, and, and that, this is kind of what I do. I, I, I'm all about severe local convective storms. Um, I think everybody has kind of a niche, and that's been mine here. I, I've worked in this market for a long time. I was in Dallas for a brief time back in the 80s, but for the most time, part of the time I've been here. So... Uh, let's see if I can make this puppy fly. Uh, so the, the, the case study we're going to look at, uh, this was March 25th of 2021. And, um, uh, just to kind of summarize the event, we had 10 tornadoes that day. And this is not real, any, any kind of historic day. It's a, I guess a standard March type outbreak here, but we had three long track EF threes. We didn't have an EF four, didn't have an EF five. Um, and we had six fatalities, uh, in the event and we had 28 people that were injured. And what I want to do here, just, and I don't, I don't like long, boring zoom calls. These are horribly boring, uh, but I'll, I'll try and keep it 30 minutes or less, but I want to kind of go through the event, uh, the setup, the things we learned, what went right, what went wrong. Um, so in terms of the communication, I know you guys can't read that, but, uh, th it was a well forecast event. Uh, and you know, so much of what we do, it's, um, it's narrative, it's text that we post across the different social platforms. And obviously video is still important, but, uh, again, if you read that, it's obvious that, uh, it was a well forecast event. And interestingly enough, on March the 17th, uh, about a week before this, we had, uh, 25 tornadoes in one day. And that was a pretty big day. And we didn't have a single injury in that March the 17th event. And, and let me just say, let me chase a rabbit here. Most of you know that we had a generational tornado outbreak here, April 27, 2011. This was 13 years ago. And in that one day, 252 people died in my state on my watch. And that really set us back. We, we knew that something's wrong. The warnings were excellent. They were timely and yet 252 people died here in one day. And what I think we learned that day is that what we do is not enough. All I know is physical science. My first major in college was electrical engineering, and I finished in meteorology. But we don't know anything about human behavior and social science, and so we tried to take this interdisciplinary approach with physical and social science. And people like Kim Cloco mclean that's on uh, you know Weather Brains and other social scientists, they're brilliant. They've really helped me to be a better communicator. Uh, and so, you know, the week before that, we had the event in which we had uh, all those tornadoes, 25 tornadoes, not a single injury. But again, this one was pretty well forecast. Uh, and, and the one thing we've really tried to stress is, is for people to help us, uh, those that really pay attention to weather. And there, there's a subset of the population that will do that. And they can help us. They can call their friends and neighbors and text them that don't watch television, that don't pay attention. And we've learned that that's absolutely critical in social science. And of course, the, you know, the, the thing that's, you know, changed everything, it's the social part of this, the social media part. And goodness, I don't know anything about this stuff. I really don't. Um, but I've been fortunate to, uh, you know, gather together a fairly large uh, following on these platforms. And if you combine, you know, Facebook and 
Instagram and the talk and the tweeter or X or whatever it is now uh, in YouTube and the others that the, the cum is about 2 million for me, which is a little high for, you know, some goober in, in, in this market, but that's a very powerful reach. And we, I reach a lot of people on the social side that would never watch television and, and you establish a relationship with them and you tell them how to watch on their phone when something's happening. And that's a really important part of what we do now. Um, and, you know, people say, why are you on the talk? Well, th I did this little talk update uh, the morning of the event here. Got a potentially dangerous, severe weather situation today and this evening, especially for the northern half of Alabama. So if you are in any of those areas where you've got orange, red, or pink colors, that's a high, moderate, and enhanced risk. Be sure you have a way of hearing severe weather warnings today. Never, ever, ever a siren. Okay. A and again, that went on for a while, but uh, understand that younger demographics are important to me. Uh, if you're 16, 17, your life is just as important as if you're 32 or 49 or whatever. And to reach that demographic, we have to be there. And you can't just say, hey, watch me. I'm going to do severe weather coverage. No, no, no. You have to have a relationship with these people way before a day like this. Uh, so that stuff's important. But having said that, that's the graphic we put out that morning in terms of the timing. And I will say the the initial SPC outlook was a little off. Uh, this was the 12Z outlook for that day. And we had a high risk for northwest Alabama, northeast Mississippi, and parts of southern middle Tennessee. But notice where the tornadoes were. They were not in that high risk. Uh -uh, there's the convective outlook. And you can see the tornadoes were mostly in either a moderate, enhanced, or a slight risk. And, you know, that's the, that's the one thing that we we're trying to do here is to get people to quit focusing on, you know, the colors and, and the risk level. And just understand there's a risk of severe storms because, you know, anytime you see a, a high risk like this, you know, all the weather dweebs, you know, their underwear is going to start flapping up down their legs and, you know, they get all excited and, hey, man, and, and you know, they focus on that high risk area. And again, the truth is, uh, in this case, most of the tornadoes didn't touch down in the high risk area. I think there was one small tornado that was brief up in Tennessee and that's it. And we've really got to do a better job of kind of getting people not to focus too much on the, the colors and the numbers and the risk categories and just understand you got a risk of severe storms. Oddly enough, the, the most intense tornado of the event occurred across the state line in Noonan, Georgia. Uh, that was an EF4. The, the Alabama long tracks were EF3s, and EF4 touched down in Noonan, Georgia that killed one person. And that was in the uh, marginal risk, level one out of five. So again, while everybody... It was focusing on that high risk. Uh, you know, here we are with the one EF4 that touched down. It was in the marginal risk. And I will say that SPC did adjust the uh, risk categories as the uh, day progressed. So uh, quickly on the setup, it's classic spring severe weather setup here. We had a, a very diffluent flow aloft with an approaching trough. At the surface, we had a warm front lifting north from the, from the south. Dew points were near 70 on the Gulf Coast. Uh, that boundary played an important role, uh, lifting slowly northward. That's the 12Z sounding from Birmingham. And uh, at that point, the warm front was still to the south, so there wasn't much cape or positive area on the sounding there. But notice the uh, very impressive directional shear on that sounding. Uh, this is kind of the big picture in terms of the way it played out during the day. We had a you know big, massive rain that came through north of the warm front. The warm front lifted north, and we had supercells that formed and uh, swept on through during the afternoon and evening hours. It was kind of a classic 12 noon to 8 p.m. type event uh, for the state. Um, this is the first long track tornado that we had. Uh, this was down for about uh, 50 miles in, in Birmingham. The city of Birmingham is, th this is the southern part of the metro, if you will. Uh, downtown Birmingham is north of this track, but this got down near West Blockton, came through very, very densely populated parts of southern Birmingham, the, the metro. Uh, Helena, Pelham, uh, Greystone, Mount Laurel, Shoal Creek, uh, and it finally lifted near Donovan. And, uh, you know, the most amazing thing to me about this is the fact that we did not have any loss of life. Here's a look at that uh, supercell uh, via the Birmingham radar. You see the classic hook. Uh, and again, you know, th these tornadoes are easy to warn for. I tell people all the time, you know, basically an eighth grader with some basic knowledge of radar could warn for these 
the hard parts, issuing a tornado warning for a QLCS tornado that's down for five minutes in the middle of the night. Uh, that That's the hard part, and that's our biggest challenge here. And again, these are relatively easy, but boy, that is a very, very densely populated part of the Birmingham metro. Uh, this is video of that tornado. This was taken uh, near U.S. Highway 280. It had just come through a neighborhood called Eagle Point. And this is like, look, guys, this is an Alabama tornado, okay? This is not Kansas. This is not Oklahoma. Our tornadoes are not sexy. They don't look good. You know, this just, uh, you, you want to do a chase down here. It, it's not, it's not good. It's hard. Um, but this, uh, that's a rain wrapped EF3. That's what they look like here. And it's crossing over a major, major highway, major artery. And again, the, the population density was very high and not a single person died as a result of this one uh, tornado. I'll play a little bit of the uh, coverage here real quick. If you didn't have seen it before. Now, if you noticed, I, I was distracted as as could be here with this thing. In fact, let me uh, stop the uh, stop that video. I was so distracted during this thing. And, and for those that don't know the story here, that that EF three hit my house, um, and, and that that long pause. That's not your typical James Span coverage. I was it was the distraction of a lifetime. Um, but. You know, you got to do what you got to do. And, and I just felt, and, and my wife pays attention. We got a weather radio. We do everything right. We have a tornado shelter, but I had to text her just to be sure that she was in the shelter. And I just did a quick text and she re immediately responded, I'm there. And I knew she was in the shelter. So I knew that she was okay. That this, It's one of these shelters rated for an EF5, but you still are human and you don't know if you have a house, um, you know, after this thing here's some of the damage uh, that this tornado uh, caused and uh, it was pretty rough uh, this is uh, some views from eagle point this is a neighborhood kind of adjacent to mine um and again for and this was an upper end df3 uh, you know and again i will say the the surveyors that did the work on this they're darn good and i will say that particular house had some uh, problems in terms of the um uh, anchor bolts. Uh, I spent some time in there looking at that, but still the fact that we had no loss of life, that, that was to me, that's a win. And that's all that matters. You know, all this stuff we do, all this stuff we do, the bottom line is it, it's mitigating loss of life. Um, uh, so this is my house and we had trees all over the house. Um, the roof was damaged severely, but by golly, the roof stayed on the house. And let me just say one thing, guys, tornadoes happen to real people that are real place at a real time. And uh, it's rough, um, but I, I'm so thankful. Let me tell you what, I'm going to find the roofer that put the roof on that house, and I'm going to buy this guy the biggest dinner he's ever had because so many of our neighbors, they lost the roof, and when the roof goes away, the walls go away, and you're in a hotel for eight months while they rebuild your house. So we were able to stay there uh, while it was being repaired. I don't know why it got so much attention. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, look, it's no big deal. I mean, people – Look, I'm I'm no different than anybody else in the path of that tornado. I think my favorite one is the one over there on the right, the, the sun. Uh, what happened to James Spann's house and who's his wife, Karen? You know, the, the, the tabloids. Like, I don't know. Uh, you, come, you know, come come on, man. Um, but this is uh, the drive home the next day after they cut the tree so you could actually drive. I had to walk over, you know, debris to get to it the first night. But they had cut down uh, the... Uh, uh, they cut through the road so you can actually drive to the house. And that's what it looked like coming through the uh, neighborhood. And let me tell you what, that's a, I've been doing this a long time, but it's a shock when it happens to you. But let me tell you something. Uh, the day after this tornado hit our house, we had this army of people. I don't even know 75% of them. They came in with heavy equipment and they started to restore order. And it gave us a lot of hope. I don't care who you are, how much money you have, where you live, when a tornado hits your house, it's um, uh, it, it's a setback. Your life is turned upside down. And these precious people, I will never, ever, ever forget their compassion and their kindness and their empathy. And again, I don't know three out of four of these people. And um, and they didn't ask for anything. They wanted no money. They were they said they were just happy to serve. And by golly, I wish I could do that for somebody. I mean, I'm so busy, but I want to do that for somebody the next big tornado day we have here. Um but anyway, enough about me. This is the uh, the same storm dropped another tornado uh, northeast of my neighborhood, and this was down for 38 miles. And here's some of the uh, coverage from that one. Check out the uh, check out the 
correlation coefficient product in that uh, TDS right there. You know, thoughts on this uh, and understand to do long form coverage right, you have to understand the geography, the people and the culture of the, where you serve. I don't care if you work for the weather service, a private sector firm, a TV station, if you're you know on social, whatever, you've got to understand the territory. You just can't read maps. You, and the one thing about being here for so long, I know these places. I, I and people can't read maps. We've learned that people can't find their house on a map. And, and you say, you know, mile marker 37 on Interstate 65. Nobody knows where that is. But if you call out Jim's Pit Barbecue, everybody knows where that is. And, and you've got to be able to have that skill set. And this is some of the damage. Uh, the community is called Ohatchee. And this is where we had loss of life. This is where six people, I'm, I'm sorry, five people were killed. We had six fatalities and all five were killed here. And uh, we just got some work to do. And uh, those that were killed were in mobile homes. Um, and we did our best to communicate on the air. You've got to get out. You can't stay in a mobile home. You cannot stay in a mobile home. And yet we had uh, this type of uh, loss of life. And let me just kind of chase one rabbit about manufactured housing and mobile homes. We have a very, you know, a lot of them down here in the deep South, away from municipalities. Um, the, the easiest thing to do is to be condescending and judgmental of people that live in trailers. And they call them trailers, by the way. Uh, I don't play that game. I, just so you'll know, I come from a low-income, broken home background in rural Alabama. And let me tell you what, mobile homes are wonderful, safe, affordable housing. I'm their biggest fan. But they're a death trap during a tornado. And goodness gracious, I'm so sick of, of loss of life in these things. And we just got some work to do. And, and the problem our friends have in mobile homes, they're getting some conflicting messages. So check this out. This was a message sent by MHI, the Manufactured Housing Institute. This is their lobby. This was a release. Now, this was several years ago. This was before COVID. I want to say it was like in 18. And this was a release that they gave to the public. This is manufactured homes are as safe as traditional homes during a storm. That's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And yet some people believe this. And that's the confusing messaging that we're hearing. Uh, so, again, this is more video coming from Ohachi. This is from Brian Imfinger and uh, Brett Adair, our, our good friends with LSM. They gave me permission to use this video. And this is right after it happened. You can see some folks being taken out of mobile homes and being put into vehicles and taken to hospitals. So you tell me that mobile homes are just as safe as a site-built home during a tornado. Shame on these people. That's absolute insanity. Um, you know, th there's just no hope. And, and and understand the problem we have, it's a complex problem. It's really complex. There are some people that live in mobile homes that hear the warning and they want to go to a safe place, but by golly, they can't because they don't have transportation. Um, and for some people, the, the nearest shelter or business that's open, it might be 25 or 30 minutes away. And they just don't. And what we've got to do, I think, in our business is come up with an intermediate product between a watch and a warning. I don't expect people to sit in a tornado shelter during a six-hour tornado watch. That's insane. If you've ever been in a community tornado shelter, those things are nasty. You know, th those things, they're just nasty. And I'm not going to sit in one of those things for six hours. But yet the average lead time for a tornado warning here, it's about uh, 12, 13 minutes. And, and for the people that might have to, you know, it takes them 20 or 30 minutes or longer, that's not going to do any good. So... We, we, as a weather enterprise, we have to come up with this intermediate product, I think, to help these people. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of loss of life. I'm so tired of it. And I understand there will always be loss of life in tornadoes. I'm not stupid. I know that we can't prevent every single death. But by golly, we can prevent most of them. And this is a unique problem that we've really got to work on here. And, uh, again, we want to work with a social scientist to, uh, to make that happen but again, that's right off Boiling Springs Road. All the coverage you saw on television, that's obviously where this happened. And that, again, that was an easy one to uh, an easy one to work. Um, and by the way, um, this is what a site built home looked like in Ohatchee. If you were in a small room near the center, away from windows, you're fine. Uh, you know, the, the MHI guys that they say, you know, mobile homes are perfectly safe. Well, that's what a site built house looks like. Uh, here's an interesting uh, story. In fact, let me get my box off of this thing. This is from the uh, storm survey. This is a business in Ohatchee. And this is, it, this is a success story. And I, often I focus too much on the loss of life and the negatives and the failures. But this was a good success story. 
Uh, the entire structure and supporting frame of this large, well-built metal building was collapsed and bent inward. The owner was on site during the first inspection of this building and said they received the tornado warning and moved all 22 employees into a safe shelter into the interior part of the building before the tornado hit. Nobody in that place was injured. The warning process does work, and uh, but we just got some work to do and we have to be uh, better. But this is all that matters to me. Uh, this is... Willie Jean and Barbara Harris in the picture on the left, and that's Ebony Harris in the picture on the right. They were killed March 25th, 2021. All that matters, it's the people. And if you look them in the eyes and get to know them and know the surviving family members and understand their stories, you'll know how we've got work to do. This is James Gino. He died March 25th, 2021. I don't have a picture of uh, Miss Wilburn, but she was killed in that structure March 25th, 2021. And this is Deborah Free. She lost her life as well uh, in Calhoun County, Alabama. And, you know, maybe most people say, well, I don't care. It's not near me and it doesn't affect me. Well, by golly, you ought to care. If you're going to do weather, you have to have the heart of a servant and you have to understand these are real people and this is a real tragedy. Even if there's just one death, it's a tragedy. So we had one more long track tornado. Uh, this was the, uh, the last one of the day. This was uh, one that was down for 80 miles. Uh, and this one moved from near Greensboro and Hale County up to about Brent and Centerville and cut through southern Shelby. The, the northern track up there, the, the one up at the top, that's the one that hit my house. This is the southern Shelby County track. And again, this was the longest track of the day. And this was one of the last ones of the event. And again, it was down for uh, 80 miles. Uh, let me tell you what, uh, you know, SPC, they did a darn good job. They're, they're really working these mesoscale discussions to focus on really small areas now. And they really nailed it with that long track tornado. And this is a great, great product and service that they offer. But let me show some of the coverage. And by the way, this is the radar image of that particular supercell on the Perry Bibb County line. This is about uh, 40 miles southwest of downtown Birmingham. Uh, and again, these signatures are just terrifying. This is graphic violence. And I know the weather weenies of the world, they get their underwear flapping up down their legs when they see this stuff. And, you know, the veins pop out on their neck. But listen, guys, this affects real people. Um, here's some of the coverage of that day. And check out this TDS right here. This is a booger. This is a upper NDF3 long track. And this was down for 80 miles. This was down in uh, Bibb County. This is southwest of Birmingham. Classic rain-wrapped Alabama tornado. They're, they're not beautiful like they are in the Plain States, but, boy, they're violent. Yeah, you bet. You bet, buddy. You got that right. So, again, this is some of the damage from this one. And, again, uh, you know, sometimes we get numb to these damage pictures. But, again, these are human lives that are just turned upside down. Uh, and uh, it was just rough. So let me just kind of go through the good with this event. Uh, the warning system was the system was well forecast days in advance and the watch warning system really worked. It really did work. Uh, understand that the tornado that got in my house, that was a very, very densely populated part of Birmingham. And um, we had no loss of life with that. That's to me incredible. We've come a long way since 2011. But uh, but anyway, we only had six fatalities. It could the death toll could have been a lot higher. But the bad, we had six fatalities. These were precious people that died. Five out of the six were killed in mobile homes. And like we've talked about, we have to do better for those that live in manufactured housing. Um, Stephen Strader and Walker Ashley, I don't know if you know these guys, they do a really, really good job of doing research on tornado vulnerability in, in mobile homes. And in one of their papers that came out in 2018, uh, they stated that from 1985 to 27, uh, 2017, over half, 54% of all the housing-related tornado deaths occurred in mobile home structures, despite making up only about 6% of the U.S. housing stock. And that's just another reminder. And, and, and you know, later, th this was in 2023, a couple of years later, the 12th of January. This is a year ago. We had a tornado event here, and we had severe loss of life north of Montgomery in Otauga County. Same problem. Uh, everybody that died in Otauga County, nine people mobile homes. So again, that's just a, a real, real problem here. So let me just kind of summarize all this. I didn't mean to talk all this long on this, but um, 
to, to do what we do, and if you want to do, if you want to be a practitioner, if you, if you want to work for a weather service office or forecast or do what I do for a living, you've got to have that servant's heart, and you've got to understand the people that you serve. You know what I do with these interns? Brilliant, brilliant college interns. And by the way, I'm not saying this because you're in this room. I've said this to every person your age in the last five years. I absolutely love your generation. Don't you dare let some old fart, you know, talk bad about your generation. I think you're brilliant. I think your work ethic is incredible. But you know what I, you, where I take them? Where do you think I take these interns? First day, first day, when I bring get them in here in the summer, we go to a local Walmart in a working class part of Birmingham. And to me, that particular Walmart represents the best cross-section of people we serve. A lot of the people in that Walmart don't look like those brilliant college students. They don't look like them. They don't think like them. They don't have the same worldview. They don't vote like them. But you're, we're here to serve everybody, everybody in this polarized country. And for some of the college students, they can't handle it. And for those kids, I say, you need to go into research. But some do an amazing job. And I have learned from watching some of the college students, how they interact with people. But I tell them, if you can't talk with people in that Walmart, you cannot do what we do effectively. So you've got to have that servant's heart. You've got to have the knowledge of the geography and of the people and the culture of, of where you serve. You've got to be able to call out those landmarks. And we've got to do better for folks in mobile homes. And, and I'd like for it to be coordinated. The one nice thing about this market, all the weather people get along, all the Everybody else at these other channels, they're my kids. They intern with me and work with me, Jason Simpson and uh, Wes Wyatt. But I think we in the weather service office here, we need to come together and in the weather service chat, we just need to decide, all right, we're going to flag people in mobile homes to get out now if they live in these places and ultimately come up with a formal product to do that because that's our greatest struggle. It's loss of life in mobile homes. But So six fatalities, and that's a loss. I consider any time we have an event with loss of life, we lose. And we've got work to do, but I'm very excited about the future. So you guys got any questions? I didn't mean to talk so long. I hate long, boring Zoom calls. They're nasty. It's just like they're, they're no good. I'd rather stick needles in my eyes and listen to some jabroni talk for 30 minutes on a Zoom call. You guys got any questions or comments? Anybody mad at me? This is your chance. Um, I got one. All right, go. Uh, you can hear me fine from here, right? Because the microphones are... You're loud clear. and clear. Five by nine. <laughs> um. So... I've actually, I've watched over your coverage of an event before, and I, I can't really figure this out on solid terms. When you're doing like live coverage, like any weatherman can sit in front of a green screen with a couplet in, on it and just say, that's a tornado again to shelter, right? Big whoop. I mean, that's helpful, but in your mind, what's the main, like the hinging bullet point that's actually going to evoke a reaction out of someone? And I'm saying this as a person who has a dad whose skull is as thick as a pumpkin. Like you could have everything on the screen and he still won't budge from his chair. Well, we, you, what's what, what, you're, what you're asking, it's a social science question. That's a great, it's a great question. And, and I would not have an answer for that unless I've spent some time with Kim Cloco McLean and Dr. Laura Myers and all these social scientists, and they'll tell you several things about that. Number one, when people look at radar, and when everybody in this room, you got your radar scope, and man, you're seeing this lowered CC and a tornado debris signature and this velocity couplet, and you're freaking out, and you know your hands are flapping around. To most people on the street, all they see is a bucket of spill paint, and you can <laughs> flap your hands up and down, and you know your eyes roll in the back of your head. You can do whatever you do. They're not going to do anything. They, they just don't buy it. The, one of the most important things we have to do is, is, and goodness, it's a nightmare here because of where we are, but you've got to get a camera on these things and show them. If you can show them a live stream of that tornado, of damage that's occurred, of something that's that's real instead of radar, they'll do something. And that's absolutely critical. And the problem we have is most of our tornadoes are rain wrapped and a whole bunch of them happen at night. And we have hills and trees and you can't see anything. But despite that, that's why... Like you saw that little segment with John Brown out there. I'll put him out there in the rain just to show we've got people out there. And trust me, there's a real storm and it's really bad. You might not be able to see it. So that that's one thing. Another important thing they taught us is the fact that you've got to stay on that wall. A lot of weather people on, on, on and again, you know, we're morphing here from the, the Ron Burgundy, you know, good evening. That stuff's going away. That's not relevant to anybody. We're morphing to the, you know, social live 
thing, which is great. Everything changes. No matter what you're doing, you cannot get away from it. you got to be on that wall because people read your body language. They read your eyes. They read your eye contact. They read what you're wearing. They read the way you stand. They listen to the words you say. And if you're not on that wall, if you go hide behind that equipment, it's not as effective. So look, I don't like the way I look on the wall. I'm some old goober with no hair. I mean, I'm not a good looking TV man like most of you people in here, but I do that because it, it's effective and people read things into that. And in the biggest problem of all, and I'll, I'll stop here. A lot of people don't hear the warnings. Uh, people don't watch television. They're, we're weather dweebs here. Everybody in here is a weather weenie. I would assume if you're going to show up on a, what is this Wednesday evening, you're a weather weenie. All right. You're not at the pub crawl here. And so we pay attention, but most people don't. They're busy. And most people don't even hear the warning. The number one reason people died April 27, 2011, what do you think it is? The siren mentality. The notion that you're going to hear some magical World War II air raid siren. Are you kidding me? Where did this come from? Who said that? They serve a limited number of people outdoors, not in a house, in a building, in a school, in a church, in, in a car. And yet here we are in the world thinks they're supposed to hear some siren. I am so PO'd with these things. I want to take them down and burn them. That way you know that you won't hear them. And okay. weather radio penetration, it's ridiculous here. It's probably 8 to 9%. That's it. In a very tornado-prone area. We've got to do a better job of getting weather radios in. But anyway, to answer your question, we've got to have more cameras. You look, if I had a half million dollars to spend, I would not go buy my own radar. I would go buy cameras and put them everywhere. Because we've got to do a better job with that. They see that, they see it, and they'll believe it. And the other thing the social scientists have told us to do, and I'll stop, use analogs for these old, like your dad with a pumpkin head, you know, whatever you got. You take, take him back to the last big tornado they had where he grew up, whether it was 1974, 1965, whatever, and use an analog and say, let me tell you what happened with that. The same thing could happen here. Let me tell you about the track. Then this is why you got to have a knowledge of the, the geography and the culture and the climatology and everything of these markets that you serve. And that's really important too. So, but there's no magic wand. It's, it's still a learning process. And there's, there's some people that will never pay attention and we just have to do the best we can do. Anybody else, man, y'all are quiet. I'm used to third graders. I speak to third graders every day. Yes, sir. I got a question. Mr. Oh, this is, this is the journalism yeah. guy. This is great. You can follow me on Twitter, by the way, but all right. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Um, how do you balance responsibilities as a chief meteorologist, a, pod, a podcast host, a community leader, and a family man? Man, that, that's my biggest struggle in life. It's time management. Uh, I have not slept since 1973. Uh, <laughs> I, I sleep weeknights between 1 and 4 a.m. That's three hours, and that's not really healthy. Um I'm very fortunate that at my age now, our kids are grown. If I would have had social media to deal with and all this stuff when they were coming up, it would have been really a struggle, but they're grown. But I've been married 42 years and ev most every evening, not tonight because I'm here with you guys, but most every evening at 630 when the news is over, I'll go home and spend the dinner hour with my, with my wife and we see each other and we talk, but you've got to spend time with your family. You've got to prioritize that. But my struggle, it's the time. And I'll tell you what's changed everything for me. It's, it's physical health. Um, there's a gym right across the street, and that changed everything. I thought I was physically dying eight years ago. Uh, I had no energy. It was bad. And I just thought, I, I'm dying. And uh, I went over there, and it was hard the first few times. The third time I went to that gym, I came back over here and barfed in this trash can right here, barfed my guts out. Uh, but now I'm down there doing burpees, box jumps, wall ball, sprints. I, I back squatted 250 pounds today. I'm doing things I could not do when I was 30 years old. And let me tell you something. When you're in good physical health, your mental cognition is so much better. I will tell you I am so much sharper now than I was eight years ago. And when you're on that green wall and you make a mistake, when it comes to calling out a location, you can kill somebody. And I'm not exaggerating. And, and that's a heavy responsibility. So the most important thing I've done is allocate that gym time for me so I can be better. And that's really important. Uh, but other than that, I'm a machine for some people. When they get old, they slow down. No, 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 no. I, I speed up. Uh, the, the minute I slow down, I won't, I won't last much longer. Like uh, so, and I don't have a magic answer, but I see my wife most every evening. Um, you know, kids, I see them pretty often. Uh, 
But I, I, I'm just thankful because when, when those kids were growing up, I'd go coach baseball between the newscast. I, I don't have any regrets, but it's hard. Time management is very, very hard. Yeah. Anybody else? Man, you guys are quiet. I like it. Uh, I talked to some sixth graders today, and I'm in a school every day, by the way. I, let me just say this. Here's a trick. Be in a school every single day. I, I know some TV meteorologists, and they do like one school a month, and they think they're a hero. What do you mean? You ought to be in one to two every day. Um, it's a win-win for everybody. You learn the territory. You have an intense knowledge of the geography by going to these schools every day. I've been doing this for 45 years. I know this state better than anybody. And when you're in there, you get kids excited about science. And you learn from them and they'll talk to you. It, it, it's just, it's great. I'm in one today. To, this is the fifth program I've done today. Uh, I, I did a program for a middle school this morning. I did a program for patients at the big children's hospital here. I did another program at the children's hospital for the behavioral health patients. I did a program for the Alabama Virtual Academy online after that. These are kids that are homebound for various reasons in this one. And it's great. I'm energized by that. But man, those sixth graders, it, those, those clowns. You know what the sixth grade boys do after PE? They spray themselves down with Axe. Uh -huh. Like they think it's love nectar. <laughs> like the girls are going to love them. Man, that is nasty, guys. It's like a sewage treatment plant here. It's bad. So yeah. if you can stand the smell, you know, the, the middle school thing, it's okay. Uh, but they, they you, you can kick it up a notch with a sixth grader. You know, you have to be kind of careful with first and second graders in terms of what you show them. But you, you can, I got them hooked. It was quiet as a mouse in there. It was good. But the school thing is very important to me. It's like a full-time job. I don't get paid for it, but it's a, it's a marvelous thing. And I'm energized by it. Some people, it wears them out for me. I'm pumped up. I'm ready to go. I have a question. Okay. It's me. As a media personality, how do you deal with that, having to face so many uh, loss of lives and property and breaking the news to people? Well, let me just say this. We got to focus on mental health. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody in the weather enterprise, except for a few people like Rick Smith. I don't know if y'all know Rick Smith. Rick is the WCM of the National Weather Service in Norman, Oklahoma. He's on Weather Brains every Monday night. And, and Rick has really been an advocate for that because let me tell you something. After what happened April 27, 2011, uh, I didn't talk about it for six months. I had nothing to say. And the NWA annual meeting was in Birmingham that year. Everybody's thinking, hey, man, James Spann's going to talk. And I, no, I had nothing to say. I didn't want to. Uh, I had to go through the process of grieving. These these are my people. They died on my watch, 252. It was an overwhelming mental burden that you don't understand. Um, and I, I went through anger and depression. I'm not a depressed person. I'm very positive. It's very odd for me. The whole thing was odd. Um, and I needed to go through the grieving process and I didn't understand it. And I didn't talk to a professional and I regret that. And listen, if anybody in this room struggles with mental health, you go to a professional, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. And in the weather enterprise, we have to be better focused on mental health. And now it's good. To, and Ken Graham's a good friend of mine. I don't know if you know, Ken, Ken is the director of the national weather service. Um, he, he is, he understands this and he is offering mental health services to weather service offices in which there's been a major tragedy with major loss of life. And I really appreciate that because I didn't have that opportunity in 2011 and it still hurts. You know, the one thing that's helped me, I, I've memorized almost every single name, every name, 252. And I know their stories. I know they're surviving family members and uh, it's very motivating for me. And uh, we just got a lot of work to do, but uh, and one of the things I also do, I volunteer. You, you got to give back. Um, I, I have been the chairman of the board of a major hospital for 19 years. I, I signed on so I could learn trauma, how people die in tornadoes. I wanted to spend some time with ER docs, but it, I just kind of fell in love with the people and the mission. And, and our emphasis is behavioral health at that hospital right now. We have to be better. And again, in the weather enterprise, we have to focus on that. Well, thanks guys. I got to run back to the uh, studio here. Appreciate you letting me, uh, share sorry we were a little delayed here but if i can do hey listen if i could do anything to help you guys let me know and again i love your generation love it and i'm good for absolutely nothing but i know everybody so if you need some help in a market or you know whatever you want to do just uh, zip me a note i answer everything you know twitter face bag email anything i'm um in fact i think i put my uh address on the last graphic uh 
the early adopters get the good Gmail address, jspan at gmail.com. That's it. Uh, <laughs> I could have gotten span. I, I could have gotten anything. It was way back when Gmail, nobody knew what it was. But uh, anyway, if you guys ever need anything, just uh, do not hesitate to uh, holler at me. But thank you all for letting me talk tonight. And uh, you all have a marvelous evening. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Oh man, his voice is like butter. <laughs> it's awesome, man. Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah.